Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code. I'm going to wait a few minutes until our uh, public uh, waiting room gets emptied into our live stream, and then we'll get started. All right, um, good, morning, good afternoon again. Uh, I'd like to get started. Uh, welcome to this meeting on the Committee of the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. I'm Mike Romano, the committee chair. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. This is our ninth committee meeting uh, of 2021. I'd like to begin with a roll call. Uh, in alphabetical order, Judge Espinoza. I'm present. Uh, Judge Henderson. Present. Assemblymember Lee. He will join us shortly. Uh, Justice Moreno. Uh, here. Uh, Professor Ochin. Here. Thank you. And Senator Skinner. Here. Thank you. Today's meeting will proceed in two parts. First, we'll hear from uh, Chief Justice of California's Supreme Court, Tani Katil Sakayui. And then we'll hear from Attorney General Rob Bonta. We're extremely uh, happy that both of them could join us today. In the second part of our program, we'll discuss the draft of our annual report and recommendations for 2021 and following public comment, vote on whether to adopt the draft report and any needed changes to it. All right. With that said, we'll begin the meeting uh, hearing from the Chief Justice, who has led California's Supreme Court for more than 10 years. She also leads the Judicial Council of California, and before she became Chief Judge, was a judge at the appellate and trial levels below that. Few people in California or in the country really have a better understanding of the complicated issues that the committee is studying and how different parts of the criminal legal system work or don't work together. And we look forward to discussing the committee's work with her. We are very happy. We are honored to have her with us this afternoon. Chief Justice, please take it away. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the committee. It's an honor to appear before you. And I wanna start off by thanking you for your incredible deep dive work into the penal code and your, I would say, truly supreme efforts at taking on a task of this magnitude. As I don't need to tell you, the penal code, its offenses, its enhancements, its standards is incredibly complex. And what you're doing is a benefit to California. I strongly believe in self-assessment and this is important work and it requires research and input, and you have maximized that. And I also commend you and the authors of the legislation from last year's session that was enacted into law. And I appreciate that you, the authors of those pieces of legislation and the committee has heard from the judicial branch and the judicial council through our judges in how to approach and some of the boots on the ground questions we have about changes in legislation that we are required to enact. So I really appreciate the work and your ongoing work, and I look forward to what happens uh, in 2022. Let me start by saying that um, I speak to you in the context as the Chief Justice of California, not necessarily as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, because as Justice Moreno knows, that's a body of uh, seven people who think independently, and I would never deign to speak for them unless they signed an opinion that uh, my chamber authored. Additionally, I'm not speaking as chair of the Judicial Council, the policy and rulemaking body for the judicial branch, because as uh, Judge Espinoza would say, he knows it's a diverse collective body. We don't move unless we investigate, question, scrutinize, and vote as a body for our proposals. So I do say, though, I draw greatly on those two experiences, as well as my time on the other courts. Uh, in deciding how or thinking about the legislation that is proposed. And in this regard, I would like to just point out that I, I view the work that you have done with great interest, uh, with an air and eye toward practicality. And of course, I would say uh, from the standpoint of the administration of justice, because that's an area of law, as all of you here know, that judges 
are, are encouraged to weigh in on and that we provide information and at the Judicial Council and at the Supreme Court and at the appellate courts and the trial courts, we have garnered a strong, uh, I would say, growing set of data and data analytics to understand our work and the impact. That said, I wanted to also preface my, co my comments by saying that I would like to speak primarily about the administration of justice, that is the business of justice, the process, because as many of you I think might agree with me, if the process is fair, uh, people have more trust and confidence in the outcome, and many of you have lived that in your professional public roles as well as in your your personal lives. So I say that the administration of justice is the business of justice. People often forget that justice has the parameters of a business because we are part of government. But that said, we are interested in the approach, the access, the equity, the impact. And I think our interest really complements the work that you are doing. You know, as the third branch we take very seriously our duty to be a check on the other two branches as they are a check on us. And that's how we all know that democracy works. At the same time, I say here to all, as you know, we don't weigh at all, we being the judiciary, do not as a voice, a monolithic voice, weigh in on the wisdom of the content or substance or goal of a particular piece of legislation because the roles we play are interpretive. We accept the intent and purpose of the decision makers and then we look at the language. And so in that way, we are able to provide uh, the kind of assistance we hope you might need. And that is data, the impact, the consequences, boots on the ground in the courts. To that end, I would say uh, in the first few minutes of my remarks that my experience has been and that of my colleagues in our judicial branch is the, uh, when possible, the greatest need for clarity of uh, retroactivity, of the effect of the goal of the ameliorative legislation and whether or not we can then take the effect of the ameliorative legislation at, that pertains to a particular individual and use it to address other aspects of his or her sentence. In other words, the scope of the ameliorative amendment. I say that because as you well know, the good work you do is very often delayed for six years at a time, at least by our data at the Supreme Court, when if we can seek greater clarity in retroactivity, application, sequence, appointment of counsel and scope, that we would be able to deliver the well-intended interest and impact sooner without having what we have at the Supreme Court, four lead cases and 300 grant and hold cases that were waiting for the lead case to resolve to address the, the balance. And that's probably been the largest, greatest challenge in the last 10 years of criminal justice reform, including the major initiatives that we have now in California. And I would conclude by saying this, and before I open to Q&A, and I will say, I want to talk about funding, and interestingly, not about the judicial branch. Of course, I always talk about that. But here, I would like to point out a group of folks who I think don't get mentioned enough that need the attention, and that is we need to better fund public defender's offices, HCRC Habeas Corpus Resource Center, court-appointed counsel, the California Appellate Projects, because these are the professionals who take on the a role of applying and executing the laws that are being passed in the legislature for people who are incarcerated or under some sort of hold. And my experience has been when I go to the governor's office or my team goes to the governor's office and we are in the middle of negotiating budget for the judiciary, which we do in November and December for the January proposal, so often I find myself asking for court appointed counsel, an increase in hourly wages, uh, an increase in cost of living for the projects that assist court appointed counsel and train new counsel. The need for Habeas Corpus Resource Center to fulfill its promise that it was to be the center for petitions of habeas, uh, habeas petitions. But over the years uh, with the changes, my experience has been that those groups have been overlooked. It's also been my experience that when cuts are inevitably made to uh, government budgets, 
uh, public defenders' offices just anecdotally often seem to get cut more than prosecutors' offices. And I think that in order to realize the benefit of these laws and to get the briefing and attention that we need, we do need to start to pay attention. And I say that CAPS, Court Appointed Counsel, Office of State Public Defender, HCRC, under the criminal justice system, those are some of the best bargains that we have. These are experienced, dedicated professionals with serious long-term, long-tail caseloads. And really, we need to be encouraging a new group to continue and start that profession, and we need to compensate fairly, sustainably, the attorneys who do that work for the courts, for their clients, for the public. That concludes my comments. Thank you. That was super interesting and helpful, and I could chat with you all day about a million topics, I'm sure. But I'd like to hear or start with my other committee members, see if they have any questions for you. Senator Skinner, and then uh, Justice Moreno. Thank you, Chief Justice. Really appreciate your being with us and also your remarks. Um, you referenced something that, of course, is debated in the legislature. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily on every bill that we um, discuss that's a change to sentencing, but certainly it comes up very frequently. And so, for example, um, in my bill, SB 1437, on the felony murder rule, I was explicit that uh, that people who are past convicted under that could petition the court, and if they and if the um, if it were to be determined that their um, conviction would have been different had the law been in place when they were, that it, the you know the court could revise. So I made that explicit. Now, however, as you pointed out, some of the other bills are not. Some of the bills are explicit that it cannot be applied retroactively. So my question to you is, you're as a judge, how does, I think the, I don't wanna say assumption, but I think the um, legislature may choose at times to not be specific in order to let the courts decide how they how to apply, and I think part of it is that question of um, if if we have changed a law and someone, for example, is serving time that had been been um, convicted under the old law, if the state feels that the law was no longer appropriate and does not explicitly forbid it from being applied retroactively. How, I mean, I, I sort of feel the court should look at it as, look, you know, if times change and now we should be looking through this lens, but I would love to hear your thoughts on it. I mean, you brought it up, so. Happy to, thank you. That's a very good question. And I appreciate how you've described uh, what's going on in the legislature, sometimes expressed, mm -hmm. sometimes not. Well, as you know, the penal code itself has a section, unless we change it, that says that uh, legislation is basically prospective, mm -hmm. but uh, unless expressly indicated to be retroactive, which 1437 is. Right. On the other hand, we have a case law that is not a statutory and not a uh, 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 it's not statutory, and, and I'm sure my colleagues here would, would know, it's the Estrada Doctrine that basically speaks to the point of, if the legislation, Senator, is silent mm -hmm. uh, uh, about its application, we don't rely on Penal Code Section 3 to say, nope, it is prospective only. We as a court, at the trial court, at the appellate court, and finally the Supreme Court, if it reaches us, decide whether or not this amendment was ameliorative? Is it, is it meant to lessen mm -hmm. a punishment or have the effect? And if so, then we assume that you legislators and the governor intended for this new law to apply as broadly as possible to as many people who can benefit from it. So we do and find based on an analysis, we can get to a silent law is retroactive, but then here's the other part. It's only retroactive uh, to cases not yet final. So mm -hmm. if a person is already exhausted 
their uh, appellate rights and they're in custody and they don't have a legal future, then we don't know if your law meant to reach that. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we are happy to, as a council, provide that information in order that the justice that you seek as a body would happen in a, in a, in a prompter fashion than as I referenced earlier. Uh, we're still, we still have cases from, from legislation five to six years ago that are still not completely answered about retroactivity. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said earlier, once you, once you have determined that it's retroactive or you intend it or we say it is, then the question is, what do we do with this new sentence? Can I use it to now turn around and apply it to all the other counts of my sentence? That's something that we see uh, needs some answering and we, we, we work our way through it, but we work through it um, because trial courts decide it differently, different courts of appeal decide it differently, then it comes to the Supreme Court and we have conflict. And that's where it takes us time to work through that conflict. So if I paraphrase then, in essence, that is why you are advising or recommending that we be explicit. Yes. Yes, and of course, uh, it's sometimes in the debate in the legislature to get that specificity will unfortunately ensure that no one from past benefits. We understand that, and that's not a bar unless it ex mm -hmm. unless it explicitly says it is not uh, retroactive. We, if it's silent or ambiguous, we're mm -hmm. going to go look to what you intended, and is it is it rehabilitative? Is it um, it, does it lessen a punishment? Then why would the legislature want one group of people to suffer with past punishment that you consider onerous, and now the now this new group that necessarily commits maybe a similar offense isn't subject to the same? So mm -hmm. we see it as your intent to treat everyone fairly and equitably. A good intent. Chief, I, I appreciate your 15 second summary of, of the Estrada rule, which no. I know, you know, is super complicated. So you can come teach my students that anytime you want. <laughs> uh, anyway, Justice Marino, I know you had a question. Yeah, just the uh, Chief Justice, I had a kind of a two part question. It's dealing with the caseload and the death penalty. You know, when I was on the court, I think the death penalty and habeas death penalty cases consumed about 25% of the court's caseload and, and resources. So just uh, two things, with the, the legislation, and forgive me, I, I forget which proposition did this, but there was some emulative legislation that uh, directed that in the first instance, habeas matters uh, should go to the uh, trial courts and to the Court of Appeal. Uh, I wonder if that's had any impact on the workload of the court. And, and second, uh, the governor has declared a moratorium on going forward on executions at least. And I wonder if that action by the governor has had any impact on the death penalty calendar and work uh, on the Supreme Court. So just two, two questions. Thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you, uh, Justice Moreno. Pro uh, Prop 66, I think, is what you're referring to, and that was billed as or known as the uh, initiative to to accelerate uh, the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is right, correct. One of its pro many provisions, one of them is, is that habeas petitions now instead of coming in the first instance to the Supreme Court, as they had for years, we follow a model more like other states, whereas that habeas petition is filed first in the trial court. And then, interestingly enough, a denial or action from that habeas in the trial court can be appealed to the Court of Appeal and then on back to the Supreme and then up to the Supreme Court. Uh, there has been at first, when Prop 66 passed, I put together a committee on the Judicial Council as required by Prop 66 to put in the rules. As, as, as you know, and many of you know, uh, death penalty habeas petitions are sort of a, a niche market. There are not a lot of attorneys, uh, defense attorneys, who have this kind of work. It's, it's long, it's, as you know, behind the scenes. And so Prop 66 uh, has, we've, we've taken at the Supreme Court by public 
order all of our pending habeas petitions that we have not acted upon, and we distributed them back to the trial courts of origin of conviction. And those trial courts now then have to find appointed counsel to represent the petitioner. And then when it goes up on appeal, new counsel is required for representation at the Court of Appeal because there could be an IAC claim. And then if it comes back to the Supreme Court, we now need new counsel for that as well. Harkening back to my, my opening remarks about needing qualified defense counsel for these sophisticated issues, as you know, once we do our state uh, uh, legal address of the death penalty and the habeas petition, then they go to uh, Judge Henderson's court across the street and start all over. So Prop 66, uh, as you can see, has not sped up anything. And some may wonder by building in more court application, whether it in fact has delayed things. But, but we have not seen a lot of litigation on Prop 66 after we decided uh, the initial case in which I was recused because the Judicial Council had duties under Prop 66. As to the governor's moratorium, the Supreme Court is uh, very aware of it, but we continue to process our cases. But you might be interested in knowing that the Supreme Court has taken a different way of processing death penalty cases now. We have uh, taken all of the briefed death penalty cases and we have triaged them to, and we're having folks take a look to see what of these cases look like it has a potential for reversal. And we're putting those to the front of the queue so that the justices can now address those sooner and faster than when they would have come in in the normal course of a chronological approach. And we are uh, continuing to, as you know, as everyone knows, continuing to address death penalty appeals and habeas petitions as well. The, motor the moratorium hasn't affected us. Yeah. There's so much litigation about the cocktail and that we, we haven't had an execution, as you know, since 2005, I believe. Yeah. So Thank I have you. a question. I, I have a question, follow, two questions actually following up on each of Senator Skinner and Justice Marino. So first with regard to the retroactivity piece, um, something that we've run into in the committee is with our proposals is that I think in general, you're correct that we feel like ameliorative sentencing laws should be applied retroactively in general. People in prison, you know, if we think a sentence should be reduced that it should apply to and anybody I think that makes common sense in most cases. However, um, obviously that adds burden to the judiciary, right? Almost always those cases have to come back to the superior courts, at least for resentencing, even if it's purely ministerial resentencing. And there's, I, I was wondering if you could give us advice on how to balance those interests because we don't, pro, we appreciate that we're giving extra work to the judiciary, but we don't control the judiciary budget and that's not part of our sort of jurisdiction as a committee. And is there a way to balance to say like, okay, um, we think that this should be done retroactively. We appreciate that that's gonna add extra work, but then we don't wanna face this, this fight with judicial counsel or, or, or I don't know, fight's the right word, but this conflict with them, because I appreciate judicial counsel is very much you know, interested in maintaining budget of the judiciary and that it's already overstretched. So is, is, do you have any advice on how we can balance those interests? That's a, that's a good question. And I think the key you said, Michael, is balance. Because keep in mind, as you already know, and I know you know this, is that the California judiciary has as much civil action as criminal action. And it's in the civil arena that we see really equitable issues as well that pertain to um, mass groups of people, particularly, I want to say, employees. And uh, we, we hear very actively from the civil bar, plaintiffs and defense side, because the more the, the courts have are taking up uh, our, 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 our stamp, our, our, we're taking up more room of criminal because we're doing habeas and we're doing resentencing and we're having hearings, the civil bar complains that we're squeezing them out and they can't get to timely resolution. So it is a balance. And all we can really ask, Michael, is that, that 
folks keep an open mind when we say to the legislature and to the governor's office and Department of Finance that these are real costs. And perhaps it, it means that you ask us to, and we happily will and have in the past, document the time it takes us, show you our, our time studies, show you our caseload studies, show you our filings that really do reflect that we are trying to do as much as we can in the day that we can, but we have only judges in courtrooms. You know, that brings up a little bit about the pandemic. We were able to shift to a remote platform for much of civil and a lot of criminal. I agree with you and everyone else that in person is the gold standard for most things, but it allowed us to catch up on some caseloads, delinquency, dependency, fam family. It allowed greater access in some arenas. And now we have uh, Senator Umberg's bill, 241, I believe, that permits civil an option to proceed by remote, which allows us to take that remotely, but still have the courtroom for the, what we need is a lot of the in-person criminal. So we just ask you to keep an open mind about it. We're happy to participate. We're happy to, to show you those numbers and to report back because we don't want that to be the stumbling block to, uh, uh, to public safety. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's precisely our balance and our frustration because like we're trying to find out what's best for public safety or administration of justice and we don't want it to be a dollars and cents issue. All right, I do have one last question, but I want to make sure we, I want to let you go as much on time as possible. Is there anybody else from the committee who has, I'm happy to cede my time? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, and if this will be the last question, if that's okay with you, Chief Justice? Sure, thank you, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see you, Chief Justice. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the Judicial Council's efforts uh, around bail reform. Um, you know, you have been a champion for uh, examining uh, and limiting the scope of money bail. Um, there's been obviously a tremendous amount of both legislation, statewide propositions, and um, judicial decisions about bail reform. Um, and the Judicial Council has also responded to uh, overcrowding in terms of uh, by using bail reform in terms of zero bail, which has been rescinded. So um, I, I'm wondering if you could talk about what the status is of uh, reform of money bail. And part of the reason why I'm asking is that I'm coming to you from LA County where our uh, populations are going up significantly. I'm sure Judge Espinoza could talk more eloquently about this than I can. Um, currently in LA County jails about almost 50% of our population is pre-trial and it's even higher in our, our women's population. Um, so we are in desperate need of uh, significant reform of uh, our bail system. And so I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about what the Judicial Council is doing in that arena. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's good to see you as well. Thank you for your work at Loyola. I always enjoy coming to your campus. Uh, we continue at the Judicial Council to have a number of uh, pre-trial pilots in various counties. I think we have at least eight. Governor Newsom has funded these uh, pre-trial projects where we are using alternatives to cash bail. And we are educating our judges not only about the use of alternatives and the Humphrey decision as well. Um, we, as you know, uh, Judicial Council, as you referenced, we studied uh, cash bail for about a year. And we came up with our 10 recommendations that were incorporated into SB 10. And uh, realizing that that failed at the, uh, at the, with the electorate, we continue to know this. Bail has changed, it will change, it continues to change. It will not be in what it was in the days when uh, I was a trial judge and we consulted a bail schedule and just rubber stamped the amount. But we want to be part of the conversation because we think that we at the Judicial Council have some expertise, we have some history, and we think that we can work within our communities in LA or our other communities to find alternatives and different programs that will guarantee the uh, arrested person's return to, to court as well as keep the, the, uh, uh, the public safe. We think there are options out there. We think, as I always said, if I understand there's great debate about the algorithms, but I said there has never been a California algorithm. 
And that's what we need to look at. We need to study it. We need to, we need to test it. We need to get data from it and we need to revise it. I know there are many, many other algorithms out there from around the country that are being used in other states regarding uh, alternative or least restrictive uh, means other than money bail, but California hasn't done that. And I think we can, and I have faith that uh, we have smart people who can put that together with our, all of our collective help. Well, thank, thank, thank you so much. I mean, all this has been super interesting. Like I said, I could probably chat with you for days about these issues. Um, I really, really appreciate your time, your comments. You know, we will definitely take them to heart. We're going to set agenda soon for next year. We obviously want to keep in close touch with Judicial Council. So thank you and thank all of the folks in your staff and the court for, for all your help. It's great to see you. Happy Thanksgiving. And, uh, and if there's anything that you think that we should address, I hope that you, you know, please let's not be strangers. Please, thank you. I appreciate our time together. Wish it could be in person. It's wonderful to see all of you. Thank you for your good work. We look forward to seeing you in the legislature. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Um, we're moving, uh, moving right along. I think I saw, it. there you are. Uh, hi, Attorney General. We're, we're, this is, this is a jam-packed day. It's star-studded. So thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we're lucky also not only to be joined by the Chief Justice, but also now to be joined by Attorney General Rob Bonta. Even before he took office earlier this year, Attorney General Bonta was well known for his efforts as a legislature to make fair and safer criminal legal system for all Californians. He's continued that mission as Attorney General, including by creating a racial justice bureau, diverting increased resources to hate crimes, and leading efforts against ghost guns coming into California. Um, I also think that you've been a, a leader in general in uh, for lack of a cr uh, criminal justice reform. I'm um, enjoyed our uh, conversations and talking with your staff. And we've, like I said, already uh, established a good relationship with your office. Um, and we look forward to continuing that in the years ahead. Um, so with that uh, brief introduction, Attorney General Bonta, we'd love to hear from you for, as I didn't get to chat beforehand, but for as long as you'd like, and then hopefully we can have some time for um, a few questions. Awesome, thank you, Michael, and uh, appreciate the kind words of introduction and really excited to be with you here today. I'll, I'll make a few opening remarks and, and then um, look forward to our conversation. And let me just uh, thank you all first for, for your leadership, um, for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. And you know, you've know you all just put in so much hard work to advance the mission of uh, the committee and launch reforms and recommendations to create a fairer and more equitable criminal justice system that advances public safety. So just first and foremost at the outset, uh, and, and, and the whole theme of my remarks is thank you. I, I appreciate your effort, your efforts, your leadership, your, your thoughtful insight to uh, fix the broken parts and uh, create uh, stronger reforms uh, that make us fairer and safer. And as someone who has both written laws and now implements and enforces them, I, I know well the challenges that, that face this committee. I also know that each challenge provides a lot of opportunity to, to improve our justice system, to advance public safety. And um, these are the challenges that uh, as a body you've been willing and able to meet head on. And, and that's really important to, to embrace that work, to own it. And your work's inspiring to me. And um, I really appreciate what you've accomplished already in a short time and look forward to the additional good work that you do going forward. And I wanna do my part to support your work, to be uh, a partner um, as the California Attorney General. I, I see my role as, as being the people's attorney to fight for everyday folks. And um, a, a lot of the inspiration for me and my work has come from my parents, who many of you know, my dad marched in Selma, uh, organized uh, for voting rights and civil rights. So I was in church with Martin Luther King Jr. Both parents who worked for the UFW. Uh, my dad worked with Cesar Chavez, my mom with Dolores Huerta. And, um, you know, that movement and their legacy taught me that when something's not right, it, it's time to fight. And so right now we must fight. Uh, we must work together to strengthen public safety in California while advancing restorative justice. And uh, that's why your work is so important, because you're finding that balance. And in the last few years, the, the call for change to our criminal justice system has been loud and it's been clear across the nation and all across California, people have spoken up and spoken out about injustice and did it even in the middle of a pandemic, uh, going to the streets to voice their concerns, uh, to demand accountability, to demand justice, to demand change. 
And to meet those demands, we must respond and we must respond with, with good policy. And at the California Department of Justice, we know that transparency and trust are essential components to promoting accountability and justice and enhancing public safety through sound policy. That's why the DOJ uh, will keep doing our part to promote access to data, um, to the data that supports your critical work, um, the work of this committee. So uh, we wanna be the partner that provides you with the data to make data driven, evidence-based um, policy proposals. Um, so we're, we're gonna continue to, to work with you on that. Um, we'll, that's why we'll also keep working to restore trust between communities and law enforcement because trust generates safety and safety generates trust. And that's why DOJ will keep working to address the systemic inequities uh, that exist throughout our state through our civil rights enforcement section, our division of law enforcement, our new racial justice bureau, and our new CARE office, the Office of Community Awareness, Response, and Engagement that will work uh, more directly uh, with and for our diverse communities throughout the state. Um, we'll be doing that uh, work all across our department. And through these efforts and, and countless others, along with your important work, your analysis, your recommendations, I think um, we can ensure that our justice system is truly impartial, that it's fair, and that it's just for all. Um, and, and those are the goals. And uh, that's the mission that you've been such an important part of. What we've seen during this pandemic is forcing all of us to, again, confront the realities of systemic inequality and racism in our nation. It's been more than a year now since the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, but we remain in the middle of a racial justice reckoning in this country. And we, we must um, answer the call and uh, provide a um, change, systemic and transformational, um, that, that is uh, worthy of the moment. And so you're all stepping up and stepping in to, to own that work and do that work. Uh, it will take sustained work by all of you and all of us uh, to make the call for change a reality. And uh, you know, as I do, that all of our communities deserve to be seen, to be valued, to be protected. And I'm confident that with our combined efforts, um, we can continue to advance that cause of justice throughout our great state together. So uh, let me end where I started with uh, a huge expression of appreciation for your work, for your commitment, um, for the reforms uh, that you're proposing that will make us uh, a better, stronger, safer, um, more just state. And happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, Justice Moreno, I see you have a question. Yeah. Uh, good to meet you, uh, Attorney General, and glad to see a Yaley in the office uh, <laughs> of the Attorney General. Not only a Yaley, but a double Yale. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. A lot of the work that uh, <laughs> that uh, we've been looking at uh, with respect to racial disparities deals with disparities in the uh, sentencing of enhancements uh, and post-conviction issues relating to post-release. I wonder if you could uh, expand a little bit on the, your, the Racial Justice Bureau and the scope of its uh, uh, activity and whether or not it would have uh, any direct application to some of the sentencing and, and post-conviction issues like parole uh, that we're facing. Thank you for your question. Um, wonderful to, to see you as well. And um, let me thank you personally for, for your work and, and for your interest in, in this specific issue. Um, the Racial Justice Bureau, I, I formed it in my second week in office uh, to really plant the flag in the ground, to, to call out racial injustice throughout the state of California and to commit to um, righting uh, uh, racial wrongs and creating more uh, racial justice. And we were focused a lot uh, in on hate crimes and hate incidents at the beginning, um, but it houses all of our work and it's an intersectional group that certainly can combine and work with our, um, our, our data team at CGIS to uh, identify racial disparities and uh, work to uh, right those wrongs. We are also uh, creating a post-conviction justice unit. So I think specifically to your point about racial disparities in sentencing and uh, post-conviction, um, that's a place where uh, some of the work uh, that I think you're referring to, uh, looking at racial disparities, looking at the data, looking at the evidence, uh, and looking at how we achieve justice post-conviction uh, can, can really intersect with our Racial Justice Bureau as well. So sort of sort of two places within DOJ where uh, the work that's clearly a, a passion of yours um, can be housed and where we can be a partner with you. 
Thank you. Uh, Senator Skinner. Hi, Attorney General Bonta, how are you doing? Thanks for being with us. Um, could I, I'm just trying to understand, so the office, the Bureau of Racial Justice, um, I know it has a few components, but then you just referenced um, in the answer to Justice Moreno about the um, looking at the uh, your office having maybe a separate office that is looking at these disparities in sentencing. What office is that? Yeah, uh, sorry for the different offices and units and uh, different organizational components of a, a very large DOJ. And good to right. see you, Senator Skinner. Appreciate all your great work on this committee and, and otherwise. Um, we're, we are setting up a post-conviction uh, justice unit. Okay. Um, in, in some of the DA's offices, it, uh, it's called uh, um, uh, an innocence commission, or uh, sometimes it, it, it looks at um, uh, wrongful convictions, but we're, we're looking at justice in all of its different forms. It could be excessive sentences that need to be reduced. It could be um, someone who was wrongfully convicted and, and, and shouldn't have. Um, it could look like a lot of different things. And we will, as, as you know, we look at uh, convictions on, on at the, in the appeal stage. And so we will be looking at um, the various types of injustice that could have been done. Uh, whether it be the length of the sentence, the conviction itself, um, uh, the, um, the, the defense uh, that a uh, individual received, uh, the potential of Brady violations, uh, lack of uh, looking at forensic evidence, uh, the fallibility of witness testimony it could look like a whole bunch of different things. And so, so is that is that one where your office would be proactive in looking at certain cases or would it be when cases were on appeal that that office would look at those we get the cases when they're on appeal okay. um okay. so that's the super majority of our criminal work is at the appellate level the da's generally handle it at the trial level right so uh the doj has generally um instinctively defended every case Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the appropriate mission is to seek justice, and that can look like different things. And so uh, we have to be open to the possibility of, um, you know, error or fallibility uh, below and uh, go wherever the facts and the law take us. So my, my third question then is on the other office, the CARE office, which is the Office of Community Awareness, Response and Engagement. Can you describe its niche as compared to the other two that you just described? Yes. So th this is really inspired by the work that you do so well, uh, the work that I focused on a lot as well as, as a legislator, which is constituent services. Mm -hmm. And I think the DOJ has long uh, been viewed as sort of a, a far away and accessible place um, where people in suits reside in a building uh, that people don't know what gets you into it. And so we want to be out in the community. We want to be sitting with community as they are uh, wrestling with their challenges. If, if it's folks who are suffering from uh, the forces of hate or folks who are being the victims of scams or frauds, we, uh, we want them to know all the ways that our DOJ can protect their civil rights, their consumer rights, their constitutional rights, uh, can be their champion. And I think a lot, a lot of folks don't know that. And it requires us to be community centered, um, to sit, uh, with community members and hear from them and build trust and co-create solutions together. And so Kat New, who you may know, is leading that team. And we have a great uh, team of folks up and down the state who are doing affirmative, active outreach into communities to uh, identify the ways that we can be their champion and, and their supporters. Okay. Suddenly, member Lee, did I see that you had a question? Other members who may have questions? I have time. All right. Um, so, uh, Attorney General, um, I was wondering if you could help point us in directions. I'm not asking so solutions are problems are easier to identify in many ways. Solutions are hard. So I'm not going to really ask you for the solutions. But you talked about you know balancing public safety, civil rights, and equitable justice. We we totally agree on that. I think that we can do both at the same time. And you also talked about uh, systemic and transformal transformative change. We've looked everywhere from driver's license suspensions to the death penalty. Where might you, do you think, is in most need of attention, study, perhaps legislative reform? Where, where would you direct us to look? 
I mean, I, I think, let me just first say, I, I think you've been very comprehensive in, 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 in the scope of your work and in, in your, your, your focal points, your um, recommendations are outstanding. And, uh, you know, the next step is putting them into, in, in, into effect and implementing them. Uh, I think there's some really important work that can be done statewide on uh, the sort of, the, the, to answer the following question, what, what is the best response to the different types of incidents that uh, law enforcement has been asked to respond to? And uh, what's the best response for a mental health crisis? What's the best response for um, someone who's suffering from substance abuse? What's the best response to uh, someone who's unsheltered and is homeless? And I think there's different, there's different answers to those questions. It's not always a, a, a police officer with a, with a gun and a badge. I think some of those are social service. Uh, responses that that need to be scaled statewide, and this isn't new stuff. Uh, you know, Berkeley is doing this, and Oakland is doing it, and there's cities that are uh, already doing it. But but I think it can be scaled statewide, and there's some there's some uh, good building blocks to that. We have a a new emergency you know mental health crisis response hotline that was created by Assembly Member uh, Bauer Kahan, and, and that's important. Um, that sort of uh, suggests the paradigm shift of. Um, not going to law enforcement for a mental health issue, but going to a mental health professional. And so I, I think sort of um, that, that sort of identifying of, of, of how we use the limited resources that we have the best way to provide the optimal response to each of the many different scenarios that are occurring each day, I think is a really important one. And I'm sure you're, you're giving thought to that and you have given thought to that, but I think that's um, a, a really important uh, co component. Um, well, we're always curious about your priorities, but you know, just simple problems like addiction to homelessness and you know, <laughs> mental health. Those are we, we got it. Don't stay too close. The answer is coming right up. No, in all in all seriousness, I do have another follow up question, which is, um, you talked about paradigm. You just mentioned paradigm shifts. So I just wanted to ask you about this, and and you even also mentioned in your office is reflexive, um, defend every conviction on appellate review. How do you think is a good way or the best way or how are you working to get law enforcement to buy into criminal justice reform? Um, the resentencing or reevaluation unit that you just described, your office has, or the attorney general's office for generations has defended every um, conviction or virtually every conviction to get even a unit of that office to sort of turn around and say like, no, we're going to start looking for wrongfully convicted people or unjustly sentenced people, or that, that is a real cultural shift or that, that we've experienced. And I was wondering how you're doing that. Um, if there's things that our committee can do to help or legislative ways to, to, to help with that. Um, but I just wanted to hear your reflection on sort of how do you get law enforcement um, support for a lot of this work? You know, as you know, uh, as folks who are pushing for reform and for change uh, and uh, caring with you both safety and justice, it, it's not always easy because ch change is hard. And um, I think it's important to really call out the, the false choice of it's either you're safe or you're just. Uh, we can and we must be both. We should have a high standard for ourselves. Uh, I've, I've uh, you know, public safety is, is fundamental. Uh, it's foundational. Uh, I haven't met one Californian in all the folks I've met up and down the state uh, who wants to be the victim of a crime. And, and there's ways to keep people safe and be uh, fair and just and compassionate as we do it. Uh, they, they can and they must go hand in hand. So they're not mutually exclusive. And so um, I think talking about that, uh, talking about the commitment that we have to, to safety and to our victims, because we're all uh, supportive of our victims, victim-centered, want to support their healing um, and the programs and services that they receive. Um, is really important as well. And so I, I just try to talk um, uh, about the, the different goals that I have together and emphasizing that safety certainly is one of them, um, but that there's, there's parts of the system where we're neither safe nor just, um, or, um, and we're certainly not both in a lot of places. And, um, and I think the conversation, the openness, uh, and also the willingness to listen, to, to hear. You know, I, I've learned in my conversations about some of the important challenges that we're facing and identified ways I can be a, a better partner with our law enforcement partners throughout the, the state. And so I think uh, open lines of communication, willingness to listen is always important as well. And, um, but, 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 the, but the change is hard, and, um, but it's necessary and it requires us to, 
to continue to, to, to push as, as you are. And, you know, I think if we lead with our values and as you like to do uh, with data and evidence and, you know, um, that's the right way to do it. You might be on mute. Oh yeah, thank you for that. I, I really do. I, you're you're saying that this is a false choice. Really resonates um, with me. Um, unfortunately, for political reasons or otherwise, sometimes it becomes. I mean, criminal justice system is adversarial by design in many ways, but it politically becomes adversarial in ways that I think um, creates that or fosters that false dynamic. And I really appreciate your efforts to try to um, disentangle that. Uh, are there any last questions? All right, um, Attorney General, let me thank you for, for coming. Thank you for your leadership. Um, thank you specifically for your assistance with this committee, particularly around our data. We really hope to be um, a resource for you, for the state, um, in terms of not just you know, uh, de developing new ideas, but working with, with the data. And I look forward to working with you in your office in years to come. I think all of, I speak for all of us when we say that, and um, we appreciate very much your time and for joining us. And I appreciate yours. Thank you, Chair Romano, for your leadership and to the whole uh, committee for all the great work that you've already done, that you're doing, and that I know you will do in the future. So really appreciate you. And if we can be of any support or assistance, please always call on us. Vice versa, please. The doors go, our doors open as well. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Have, have, have a good afternoon. Thank you for, for, thank you for your time. Of course, you as well. Um, all right. Um, before we move on to, we're going to switch gears in a second to talk about our recommendations to for uh, the coming legislative cycle. I'd like to take a, a five or six minute break. So let's reconvene at uh, 2 p.m. and uh, we'll we'll get to that business. Thank you. <laughs>